So if you imagine chemical reactions, whenever a reaction takes place, we have a change in energy. And sometimes that's really obvious, sometimes we can see that happening, sometimes it's not quite so obvious. But no matter what happens, we invariably have some sort of change in energy. Um, and what happens is we, we find that reactions fall into two categories. Um, they tend to either be exothermic or endothermic. And what that means is that either they release energy as the reaction occurs or they take in energy as the reaction occurs. So this one here, exothermic, is releasing energy. So they release energy, the reactions that is, and in endothermic cases they take in energy. And that's exo, therefore is going out, endo is coming in. So as I said, some reactions are obviously exothermic, some are obviously endothermic, and we can take advantage of those. So for the example of an exothermic reaction, things like burning fuels, that's an obvious exothermic reaction where energy is released, of which we feel as if it's a, if it's fuels burning within our home as hot water, or just as heat from radiators, or in cars, we get that energy released and it ends up in the the motion of the car. Um, less important ones: self-heating coffee cans, things like that. Um, self-heating food cans as well, um, and other ones: hand warmers, um, and one of the best ones there, the reusable hand warmers are, are quite nice in that when you um, click the button or the piece of metal that's within them, you actually find that it, it crystallises and that process of the crystalli crystallisation is an exothermic process. So in that case, energy is released and um, we we can feel it and we can warm our hands on it. Endothermic, slightly less here. Um, the key one, particularly at school age really and within sport, um, are the ice packs. The packs where you basically crush two chemicals together um, and it gets cold very quickly. In that case the energy is being taken in from the environment. So with this one here, exothermic then, energy is released and we see that as a temperature increase. Endothermic, energy is taken in and we see that as a temperature decrease. And that's the simple way of describing these two. Now we can look in a bit more detail and see well, what's actually happening in terms of the exothermic reactions and in terms of the endothermic reactions. And what we can do is we can draw a, or we can draw energy level diagrams to represent this. Now, these energy level diagrams have an axis, or have axes, and these axes have energy along one side, and I guess time along the other. And I'm just excluding units just for the sake of just showing what's happening. Um, and what we could do is, we, if we think about an exothermic reaction where energy is lost in the reaction, well the energy is lost and that's what we measure as heat. We can see it, um, or we can feel it certainly. Um, we might also find that we can measure it as well using the thermometer. So energy must be lost. So if this is our reactant up here, then when the reaction occurs, our products must be at a lower energy level because energy has been released to the environment. So the en reaction occurs something like that. So the reactants are at a higher energy than the products. And the difference between that is the energy lost. Something that we call the delta H. And that's called the delta H, the enthalpy change regardless of whether energy is lost or taken in. Um, and we'll look at that in a second, the term enthalpy change. This other bit here, this, this hump, is actually the activation energy, which I'm going to call Ea. And remember, from rates of reaction, the activation energy is the energy that's required for an, a reaction to actually begin. So if two particles collide and they do not have the required activation energy, the reaction just will not go ahead. And we can see now almost from this energy level diagram here, so just to make that clear, this is an energy level diagram. This hump here, if you imagine having a ball which started at the bottom of, of, this, of this sort of imaginary hill here, our ball starts here, 
if we were trying to push the ball up, we would have to put energy in to get it to this portion here. Once we reach that portion, it would then roll down freely. And that's almost what happens. The energy being put in here is to overcome the activation. You get the ball to this point or to get the reaction to the point where it's just about happy to go. And then we find the rest of the reaction is the releasing energy. And obviously, the energy lost is is this portion here between the reactants and the products. To flip it the other way around, this being an exothermic example, and all exothermic reactions will occur in with energy level diagrams that look like this. The other way around, oh, that's a terrible line. The other way around, we have just the complete opposite. So again, axes, energy, time we're now putting energy in energy is being taken in from the environment which we see as a temperature decrease so our product our reactant sorry must be down here and our products must therefore be at a higher energy level because the energy go comes from the surroundings and goes into the chemical reaction um, ultimately giving us this this change here in in energy so in this case our delta H, our enthalpy change, is here between, the, again, the products and the reactants. This is now an energy gain. And the other weird one is, and that should be at the top really there, this is the activation energy now for an endothermic reaction. These tend to be talked about a lot less in exams because they are a little bit more fiddly, certainly with the activation energy being greater. Uh, this tends to be the one that you would see in an exam. Um, and I'll talk about how the delta H can actually give you the idea of how, what to draw here. Now one thing worth mentioning is that with this being an exothermic reaction on the, on the left and an endothermic on the right, people often get these confused. The idea that with an exothermic reaction we have again like the first portion there we have a temperature rise and with an endothermic we have a temperature decrease and people often get this the wrong way around because they see the energy going down yet the temperature goes up but remember that although the energy of the reaction decreases so the energy within the reaction so the difference between the reactants and the products is an energy loss that energy that's released goes to the environment and that means ultimately that it's the environment that we are measuring the temperature of so just outside of the reaction so imagine again as I've talked about previously, two particles come together and react. They react like this. Just outside this, this is the portion we are measuring now, anywhere outside of this reaction. This energy level diagram just represents the energy change between the reactants and the product. It's not talking about the surroundings, the our living room, you know, when we when we uh, light a fire, or the solution that we measure the temperature of. It's talking about the reaction itself in terms of energy. Other way around, the same is true. It seems like because there's an increase in energy but a temperature decrease, that gets confusing. But again, remember that energy is being taken in from the surroundings, in this case into the reaction, and so the products end up at higher energy than the reactants do. So the last thing I just look up here is this term enthalpy change and really kind of not necessarily what that means because it can be quite strange but um, a couple of examples of things you might see in an exam so this thing here enthalpy change measured in kilojoules per mole now an enthalpy change is to put it more simply than anything else, is really just the energy change of the reaction. And that's as, that's a, a fair way to remember, really, what's occurring. It's an energy change for the reaction. But what you'll see is you'll get a couple of different signs. So an enthalpy change can either be negative, or an enthalpy change can be positive. Depending on whether it's negative or positive depends on whether it's an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction. If we remember that energy is lost in an exothermic reaction, this one then is exothermic. And because energy is gained in an endothermic reaction, 
that one is therefore endothermic. And if we were to go back up here, just to look at these diagrams again, energy goes from this point here to this point. Energy is lost, therefore the energy change is a decrease, it must be negative. Here, our energy change is going from low to high, therefore there's an increase, it must therefore be positive. So what you might see in the exam is you might see, draw an energy level diagram for a reaction where the enthalpy change is minus 422 kilojoules per mole. And in this case, all you would need to do would be draw your axes, or use the provided axes, it doesn't matter. Axi labels are not normally an issue in energy level diagrams. Do exactly what we did before. Reactants. Start at a higher energy level. Products at the bottom. If you were given products, then you would of course actually write them in, but I'm just using the as this generic reaction. And again go over. And often these kind of things, these questions will maybe specify including your answer label the activation energy, label the density change and all the rest of it. But if they don't specify that, it's always a good idea to include the activation energy as this hump part here and the enthalpy change as this portion between the reactants and the products. And again this one being an exothermic reaction. So just to conclude this video we've looked at exothermic reactions and endothermic reactions in terms of temperature increasing and decreasing in the reaction retrospectively. We've then looked at how that is actually determined through the energy changes with exothermic reactions giving out energy, endothermic reactions taking in energy, uh, and how that looks on an energy level diagram and then associating that to either a positive or a negative number within the enthalpy change. So the one final thing to look at is how a catalyst affects um, an energy level diagram. Now, from rates of reaction, you should be able to describe that a catalyst um, lowers the activation energy and therefore speeds up a reaction. Um, and it lowers the activation energy um, by providing the reaction with an alternate pathway. So that's the definition, really, of how a catalyst affects a reaction. Now, what they do quite like doing is asking in the exam about how to draw or to draw onto an energy level diagram the effect that a catalyst would have. Now, if we imagine we've got some axes like this and we've got our reactants going to our products something like this um, and this would be here this would be our activation energy now a catalyst lowers the activation energy therefore when we apply a catalyst to a reaction this line changes we still start at the same point, we still end at the same point, but we now have a lower line. And this now has a lower activation energy. And again, that has done that by providing an, an alternate pathway. Now don't worry about what that means, just learn it. So learn that that's what a catalyst does. It lowers the activation energy by providing an alternate pathway for the reaction to take. And so this is how you would draw it. So this line here, red equals catalyst, it has dropped the activation energy down from up here. And again, if you imagine that whole ball scenario here, the balls needs lifting up here. It now has to only be picked up to here, and then it would, it would carry down. So it requires less energy to get to this point. Therefore, in order for the reaction to be, or the collision to be successful, it now has, it's more likely to be successful, I should say, because the activation energy is lower. So when the two particles collide, it is more likely that they will successfully react in doing so. So I hope that video has been some help.